You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Bitcoin, Ether, Ripple, Litecoin, and more. Cryptocurrencies and other digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity. Provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments on everything from coins to tokens, futures, and even OTC options. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on the Crypto Rundown. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time for the Crypto Rundown. everybody that music means it is time once again for the crypto rundown the program here on the old options insider radio network where we break down everything going on on the other side of the fence the crypto side of the fence going to talk some bitcoin some eth and all the other fun going on there in the options the futures the volume the volatility the oi the skew all that good stuff and a whole bunch more. My name is Mark Longo from the aforementioned network, reminding you, if you like what you hear, not just for this show, but for everything we do here throughout the week, multiple shows a day hitting you on the network these days. We've seen quite a slew of people discovering the network day in, day out. If you want to keep that flow coming, if you like what you hear, leave those reviews on your platform of choice so new folks can continue to discover our content. And of course, keep those questions coming. We do love to hear from you guys. And speaking of hearing from people, let's see who we're going to hear from today. In the old crypto hot seat. Forget about cold storage. It's time to turn up the heat on thought leaders from the world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time to take their place on the The crypto Crypto hot Hot seat. seat. All right, everybody. Welcome to the crypto hot seat. Like the man said, this is the portion of the show where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of crypto derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you. The listener next up in the old hot seat is a returning offender, even though he hasn't been on in a little bit. It's Mr. Kapil Rothi, the co-founder and CEO over there at Crosstower Crypto Exchange. Mr. Rothi, welcome back to the Crypto Rundown program. Good afternoon, Mark. It's really great to be back on the show. How are you? I am doing well, sir. How are you and how is the family? How are you guys holding up in the midst of all this madness, shall we say, sir? Yeah, I'm just hoping we're in November. Hopefully 2020 is over soon. And and we will be on the other side. Yeah, I don't think anyone will be reluctant to flip the calendar. It's going to be probably a big party on New Year's this year, more than usual, just to just to put this year in the rear view mirror. Of course, we have a few things to do before then, including, of course, our big election night special tomorrow, listeners. So whenever you're listening to this, if it's prior to Tuesday, November 3rd, make sure you join us live starting about 6 p.m. Central. But tomorrow night we're here. We're going to be broadcasting live with a... Great slew of special guests breaking down all of what's going on in the in the markets and how they're reacting to the results coming out of the election. Don't worry, no political nonsense. No, this candidate is great, this candidate is awful. You can get a lot of that everywhere else. We're going to be just down the middle, just the facts, ma'am. So hopefully you guys like that. I'll be joined by a great slew of special guests to help me break down that all that 
and a lot more. And speaking of great guests, of course, Mr. Rothy, you spent a little bit since you've been on. You were on last, I believe, towards the middle of June. So obviously a lot has happened in the crypto space. Obviously a lot happening in your neck of the woods. So why don't you catch us up? Maybe first off, for some of our newer listeners who may have missed your last appearance, give us a quick overview of what the heck it is you guys do over there at Crosstower again. And then B, uh, catch us up, sir. What's new? What's the hot thing over there in Crosstower these days? Yes, sure. So for the benefits of listener, a quick uh, background. Uh, we launched uh, Cross Tower in May of uh, 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, if building a company itself is challenging, you throw a pandemic on top of it. And, and if you can survive that, I'm sure I, I can probably write a book about it. Uh, the, the good news is we actually have survived and we're doing really well. Uh, just quick background. So Crosstower is a digital asset trading platform. We are headquartered in New Jersey. We operate uh, two r- related business lines. First, we operate uh, uh, two exchanges. Uh, one is uh, based out of uh, regulated in the U.S. and the other is regulated in Bermuda. Uh, our second business line is uh, our structured product division, where we offer uh, interest rate products, lending, borrowing, and uh, custom structures for uh, large institutions and hedge funds who want to gain exposure to crypto without necessarily taking all the operational compliance, security, and other risks. Uh, Since launch, uh, I I know, Mark, we talked about it, and you sort of kind of asked me, like, why the heck you're, you're coming in the crypto exchange space and and I, I cannot, we, we kind of joked about it that Google was not necessarily the first search engine. Um, in the last four months, uh, the feedback, the excitement that we have uh, seen from our customers is just remarkable. Uh, in five months, we have uh, now added uh, 20 plus institutional customers who are currently trading on our platform. These are large market makers, asset managers, prop trading firms. Uh, on a typical day, we are trading somewhere between eight to ten million dollar in trading volume, which uh, which puts us at the, in, in one of the top five or top six exchanges in the U.S. Um, so our growth has been very exponential. Month over month, we are growing. Um, uh, today, we are trading spot, and we are in the process of adding. Margin trading, futures, and options on crypto. I like it. Options coming soon. And is it entirely Bitcoin or anything else going up over there across tower these days? Uh, so we are today trading top 12 cryptocurrencies. And uh, we are actively looking at what are the other options out there or currencies out there. We are a member of the Crypto Rating Council uh, where we actively participate in sort of uh, qualifying what uh, which current cryptocurrencies can be considered securities, which cannot be. Uh, of course, in U.S., uh, according to U.S. regulation, we cannot trade any securities on our exchange. So we carefully look at every option out there. Um, but as of today, we are with, our number is about 12 top. 12 cryptos by volume. I know you guys just got a, a new license out there in Bermuda. Why is that such a big deal, Kapil? Um So I think uh, when crypto is a, is a real global asset class, right? So we have uh, customers. Initially, when we started, our primary goal was to have win co- or sort of uh, serve customers in the U.S. And then pretty soon, we started getting a lot of inbound from our global customer base. And uh, we also, uh, especially for our structured product division, we cater to uh, large institutions and hedge funds who have uh, entities established outside U.S. So we reached to a conclusion that it will be beneficial for us to serve a global community, global customer base uh, in a jurisdiction which is... um, Regulatory, uh, from a regulatory frame, framework perspective, uh, well defined. Uh, they are conservative. 
uh, from the, the compared to some other uh, options out there, uh, like bankruptcy laws, you can actually enforce the contracts uh, can are enforceable. So we decided to choose Bermuda to have a, a second exchange, which is primarily geared towards our global customers. And obviously, you focus on that core institutional audience. We've seen a shift in the price and indeed the volatility of Bitcoin since the last time you were on Koppel. So I'm curious, you know, what have you been hearing from these institutional clients over recent months? And indeed, has this upswing in the price or maybe a little bit of change in volatility, has that changed their tune at all? You found them to be maybe more interested or perhaps less as a result of what's going on? What are you hearing from the institutional clientele out there these days? Oh, yeah, I think uh, uh, especially from an institution perspective, one of the reasons why we launched our structure product division is uh, we started getting a lot of inbound calls from uh, hedge funds, asset managers, and uh, uh, I don't know if it's the formal fear of missing out or just the, the price movement, and especially as you're hearing um, a lot of uh, large institutions like Paul Tudor Jones, Renaissance Capital. Um, now you have uh, Square App coming into Square coming into this. Uh, there are uh, CFOs who are uh, deploying their treasury capital into Bitcoin micro strategy uh, is, is a big, great example what they're doing out there. So from an institutional perspective, crypto is now uh, has become fully mainstream. I think we have come out of the experimental age uh, of uh, uh, crypto. We are 100 percent mainstream. So with, the, with, with these inbound inquiries that we get, we started getting. Uh, most of, uh, especially family offices and asset managers, uh, started asking about the risk that comes with uh, investing in crypto. Uh, especially, you have operational risk, you have security risk. Uh, they don't want to deal with the private keys, wallets. Uh, so there is definitely a desire, but there is a fear of uh, of uh, all these issues that come with it. Um, so. To address those concerns, we launch our structure product division where we help these uh, large asset managers and hedge funds to gain exposure to crypto without taking those risks. And uh, we, we manage uh, risk for them. We come, we, we come up with the products that uh, kind of ring fence those issues. Uh, but overall, I think uh, it, it's the the question about whether institution coming uh, or not is uh, is now the rear end. Well, you mentioned risk, and indeed regulation is, is the other side of the risk coin. Since you've been on back very recently, Koppel, we've seen the, the other side of that, some of the regulatory risks coming in on the crypto derivative side, most recently and probably most infamously with BitMEX. BitMEX has been the big dog overseas for quite some time when it came to crypto derivatives. Of course, you never really profiled them here on this program because they were off limits for most of the U.S. clientele here. They just weren't a viable option, pun intended, for a lot of our U.S. listeners, certainly on the institutional side, of course. Uh, since your last appearance, Koppel, we've seen now the CFTC and the Department of Justice both filing actions against BitMEX CFTC for effectively saying BitMEX ran an unlicensed crypto derivatives exchange, DOJ actually making criminal indictments against the two founders. So that, of course, putting into stark relief some of the risks of playing on some of these unregulated venues out there. I'm curious for you guys, you guys are very much operating as and want to be the regulated go-to source for crypto derivatives. So how have these recent actions impacted you guys? Have they maybe spooked some of the institutional players you've wanted to work with? Maybe they look at this and say, wait a minute, we're going to take a step back from these markets. They're still kind of the Wild West. Or maybe has it been the other way? Have they driven some inquiries to you guys? Because you guys are obviously looking to play within the regulations out there, Koppel. How, How have some of these actions impacted you guys recently? Yeah, no, I think that's it's uh, it's probably an understatement that uh, industry is uh, going through a, a kind of like a seismic shift into moving from uh, these non-regulated exchanges towards uh, more and more regulated exchanges. Um, if you take a step back, in, in general, the, the crypto finance uh, ideology is designed not to be controlled by a central governing body. Uh, the flip side of that is lack of credibility. 
when we talk about uh, going from early adopters to mainstream, uh, it is a big leap of faith. Uh, you, you have to instill the concept of risk management from top to bottom uh, in, in, in an, or any organization uh, who is uh, um, kind of dealing with the uh, investors, there must be a clear appreciation of risk management uh, in, in your team, your vendors, your customer. And uh, this is why we have taken a, a holistic and sort of long-term approach. Uh, digital asset in general is, is a product first mindset and the activities surrounding to operate uh, that product are still the same. Like you have to have risk management, you have to have business continuity, you have to have all sorts of regulation, compliance, KYC, AML. Um, I mean, US, uh, especially since uh, 9-11, uh, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, US has done a remarkable job by putting tight regime around terrorist finances, uh, anti-money laundering issues. Uh, you can't just circumvent those. So um, I think uh, any in long term, if if there is any company who is going to survive in this space, must uh, uh, take a holistic risk management approach and take a look at what the current regulations are, how they are developing, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I understand that there is probably some uncertainty around regulatory space, uh, but clarity is coming. Uh, both SEC, SEC, CFTC have been sent providing guidance. Um, there are state level regulators. So I, I think it's the industry is really pivoting towards uh, regulated exchanges, and we are hearing it uh, every day from uh, our customer base that they only want to work with uh, people with uh, credible background, and it's it's been helping helping us quite a lot. Well, speaking of that regulatory landscape, obviously it's in flux. These latest developments show maybe some of the uh, the more active side of it coming to work in the crypto space of late. What are you guys hearing behind the scenes? What are you seeing talking to the regulators and, of course, talking to the players in the space? Do you think we're starting to get a little bit of a firmer grasp out here on how the regulations, how the landscape is going to start shaping up? Or maybe on the flip side, obviously, we have a big event coming up in about 24 hours here in the U.S. Is everything on hold until all the dust settles from that couple? Or are we starting to get a little bit of clarity on how this space is going to unfold from a regulatory perspective? Um, there's, there's definitely a lot of dialogue on the Hill about it, uh, especially I think CFTC is taking a uh, pretty uh, uh, amazing, solid leadership approach to this, uh, especially I think uh, U.S. government and regulators are also recognizing the fact uh, that uh, we don't want to fall behind in in the innovation cycle. Uh, when you hear China is now leading the development of uh, uh, central bank digital currencies, that itself is is a risk uh, to probably the U.S. dollar itself. And uh, there are dialogue with. Fed, Federal Reserve is working with MIT uh, potentially to have a central bank digital currency uh, based uh, out of uh, based on U.S. dollar. Uh, but overall, I think there is there is a recognition that uh, we we cannot fall behind in uh, this amazing journey or the evolution of money. Now, along that lines of regulation, you mentioned uh, kind of earlier in our conversation, you guys joined the Crypto Rating Council. Why don't you fill our audience in on what does that body do? Um, so Crypto Rating Council, CRC, is a group of uh, leading uh, crypto companies, uh, exchanges, um uh, issuers um, and uh, other uh, custom of the custody providers are there, which essentially uh, look at every project out there and uh, go through a set of uh, uh, tests to uh, ensure or to sort of provide uh, a, a rating that uh, whether this particular project is could be deemed as a security or not. Uh, it is a collective effort by the industry 
Uh, so it's not left to individual exchange or individual participant to decide whether uh, uh, a project is a security or not. Of course, if it's a security, it must be traded on a SRO or a securities regulator or a self-regulated organization like, such as exchanges. Um, the, uh, it is it is a rating system. It doesn't necessarily uh, provide any further sort of uh, or, or verdict that it should be seen. Uh, or it, it's it's basically you can't just use that that information. So it it provides a good framework, and then it is up to individual exchanges. We have a very rigorous uh, listing framework, a selection process on our end. We use CRC rating as one of the criteria, and then we go through our own uh, exercise of doing how we test, looking at uh, the backers, the owners of a project, uh, run through all sorts of uh, background checks and the data, uh, all fact list, and we, we, and we, we make sure that there is nothing shady going on with a particular project before we list it. So it's a, uh, it's a good sort of uh, baseline that gives us uh, a, a jump start before we list uh, any any new new project. So I guess in light of not really having any firm or clear guidance from the regulators yet, this is kind of more of a industry self regulatory type body, maybe to get out there and establish some best practices and maybe kind of pave the way for how the regulators plan to follow down the road. Is that the plan, Koppel? Yes, uh, and of course, I think we do. It's it's very clear that if it is security, then it goes under SEC's jurisdiction. Uh, CFTC has already uh, declared Bitcoin and ETH as commodities. So anything related to commodities, and especially if it's a derivatives, it's under CFTC. Uh, other than that, uh, as long as there is a project that's not a security, it is uh, it has a utility. Uh, it uh, in 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 under in US uh, it trades uh, under uh, the FinCEN umbrella so we are regulated by treasury department and we also are regulated by different states every state has slightly different requirement uh, as a money transmitter and have new firms been welcoming of this initiative have they been embracing of what you guys have been laying down to them in terms of guidance or they may be a little bit hesitant because after all you know crypto <laughs> kind of the the founding ethos the spirit of it is decentralized so have they been receptive to this new crc initiative sir um uh, i don't think everyone is participating in that uh, initiative i think it is left uh, to individual firms choices uh, we probably being the most conservative from a regulatory standpoint for us it was an easy decision right out of the gate we joined uh, crc and not only just to kind of leverage their uh, research, but to also contribute into this project. Uh, coming from traditional market, of course, there is a defined listing framework, defined listing criteria before uh, a new uh, IPO goes live or a, a new a new uh, a, a, a new uh, security is added on exchanges. So we just want to kind of leverage, reuse that experience. I think. Uh, if you want to build a regulated exchange, if you take a conservative approach, and especially someone like us who comes from SEC and CFTC regulated exchanges background, we know what that kind of uh, blueprint is, and we're applying the same principles in building our You know, it's funny, just the different extremes that exist in the crypto space. Just last week, we had uh, folks on from the DeFi space talking about the decentralized you know, finance movement and trying to provide some of the functionality that exists in traditional marketplaces and trying to apply it to that DeFi space. Things like, how do you make an order book in a, in a DeFi marketplace? How do you provide a market maker? You have to actually try to automate some of that functionality. So it's interesting to see the extremes people are going to. Have you been paying attention to that side of the market, the DeFi side of the space, Koppel? And if so, I know it's kind of very much counterpoint to what you guys are doing out there, which is a very centralized, regulated type environment. But what are your thoughts on the growing interest in that side of the space, sir? Yeah, no, I think you, you cannot ignore, ignore the DeFi euphoria. Uh, I, I have to really compliment uh, what technology technologists are doing. I mean, I think uh, the, the, we are challenging the concept of money. 
Uh, I'm really fascinated how engineers and computer scientists are looking at monetary policies and how they are finding that our monetary system is slow and integrated. Um, we don't really talk about the issues of uh, uh, current analog system of money. Um, if you look at them, I mean, why, why, did, why did it take five months to get a stimulus check out to its recipient? Why can't it be instantaneous? So the concept of money is being challenged. Uh, now we have uh, uh, peer-to-peer transactions, and that's where the DeFi comes in. I think uh, um, technology-wise, it's, it's a great innovation. Uh, I think it will uh, grow from where it is. I don't think uh, we can, uh, uh, we, it, we won't be able to kind of shut it down, but I, I rather actually see it growing further from here. Uh, on the flip side, the challenge is uh, uh, how do you do KYC? How do you do AML? How do you make sure that there are no bad players coming into this? Um, so I, I actually see our industry evolving into a, some sort of hybrid of uh, CFI and DeFi, where uh, the concept of peer-to-peer trading, peer-to-peer lending is going to mature while we will make sure that the bad elements are not able, not coming in and just uh, laundering their bad money. Um, I think uh, it definitely is, is challenging the banking system the way we know it. Uh, the banks are kind of, I mean, the purpose of bank is being challenged. Do we really need an entity to take deposit and then distribute it as a loan? Can I just go online and announce to the world that I have ten thousand dollars and I, I want to earn five percent interest? An algorithm will actually match me with someone who's willing to give me that five percent interest. That's essentially a banking function. I mean, this is why banks exist today. Where if I want to uh, get mortgage on my house, I can go to bank. But uh, I, I I think that that there will be time when. I should, probably will be able to get loan into a decentralized place, uh, marketplace where I don't have to deal with the central, central party. So the concept is amazing. Love the way how technologists are challenging our, our integrated monetary policies, but we just have to make sure that we keep the bad elements out of it. You're right. It does seem like the inevitable future is some sort of hybrid of these two environments. That's what makes this whole space and indeed this show so fascinating to do week in, week out, because we're seeing this constant push and pull between what people expect and are used to on the traditional financial side in terms of regulation and execution and all these other things and what people have come to expect from the crypto side of the space, which is sometimes the complete opposite. And how these worlds come together is just a fascinating thing. Speaking of fascinating things and fascinating products in and of themselves, you mentioned earlier your kind of structured product arm over there at Crosstower. We have seen a lot of interest and a lot of developments in the worlds of stable coins. I know they're, those are attractive, I think particularly to the core area of the audience that you're going after, the institutional clientele who maybe are spooked by a little bit of the volatility going on out there in the spot or in the futures or indeed some of the options. So, so what are your thoughts uh, on the stablecoin side of the space, Koppel, and, and why is this so interesting to you guys over there at Crosstower right now? Yes. Uh, so I think uh, when, when we talk about cryptocurrencies, everybody just thinks about Bitcoin and ETH. Uh, I think uh, some of the interesting use cases where I'm really optimistic about uh, of, of the blockchain technology and cryptography is the evolution of uh, stable coin and eventually um, central bank digital currency, which is sort of like in a stable coin. Uh, so just, if I can just sort of break it down, like if you, when the, the stable coin we call today, such as Tether, uh, USDC, Libra, these are uh, uh, tokens that are pegged with uh, a, uh, with the assets that are held in a bank. Uh, these uh, as these stable coins provide uh, the same financial stability and security that's uh, that you can expect from the underlying asset itself. Uh, if you are pegged to U.S. dollars, it must have the same stability 
like it's backed by Federal Reserve. Uh, stable coins themselves, they don't give you any store of value like the way Bitcoin does. Uh, they give you a faster payment of system. You don't have to go through an intermediary to actually do transactions. Um, of course, it comes with its own challenges that we need to make sure that the adequate amount of assets are held in reserve backing these stable coins. Uh, the redemption process is foolproof. Um, and then you sort of kind of take one step further is uh, what's happening in the central digital bank currencies world, CDBCs. Uh, that's essentially a digitized version of a pound. So it's not pegged by a currency. It is the actual digital currency itself. Uh, something that, uh, again, it, it could be a digitized version of pound or euro or yen or U.S. dollar, if you will. Uh, it, is, it is a programmable money. Uh, the result would be uh, for the ability of central government to actually adjust the value of currency under uh, certain predetermined conditions. Uh, imagine a currency that has a dynamic value, right? So let's say if you want to stop funding any illegal activity, uh, you want to seize funds, you can do that without going through network of banks, you can essentially just completely kill the value of that particular set of digital currency. Uh, or if you want to um, s provide benefit to a charity or, or a stimulus package uh, or incentives to consumer to uh, spend more towards green energy, you can manage the value of that, that currency itself. So there is just amazing... Uh, I mean, a lot of use cases that are coming from uh, the digitization of money. Uh, China is actually uh, taking a really uh, uh, amazing lead in this space. Uh, I think what I heard is the catalyst was Libra. So Libra is a stable coin. I think the way it was initially designed was packed to a basket of currencies. Uh, I'm not too sure where they landed at this point. But that was a catalyst for China. They pretty much they realized that Oh, there is a private money coming in. Uh, before it gets too late, why don't we have our own central currency? And, and then COVID happened. So COVID uh, essentially uh, has pushed the entire society into faster digital payment. Uh, between these two big events, I think uh, now 80% of central governments are actually looking at having their own digital form of money, which is faster which is programmable, which is controllable by central government. So it's just fascinating how the concept of money is changing. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad that we are involved in this industry at this point. We're really lucky to be living through this uh, sort of evolution of uh, what we use to what we know as money. Well, I'm glad we can get you in the crypto hot seat today, Mr. Rothy. We have to keep on rolling with the rest of the program. But before we do, we touched on a lot of different areas in the crypto space in this conversation. But maybe you want to leave our audience with a little bit of a hint, a little bit of a tease of what's coming down the pike from you and the team at Cross Tower. Now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. Yeah. I mean, of course, there's, there's a lot of excitement in, uh, at Cross Tower. We are in the process of uh, rolling out our margin product, uh, our futures uh, Product is uh, almost complete, and uh, we 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 are, we are talking to a lot of institutions and hedge funds out there to help them get gain exposure. Uh, I think if there's one message I can leave with is uh, probably our own our, my my friends from traditional world. If you if you still haven't jumped into this space, if you're still sitting on the sideline, uh, it's not too late. I think we are. We are starting uh, at a at a really mature stage, so there are there are risks that can be managed, but this asset class is not stopping. So uh, there is a lot of talent where you are in Chicago, uh, in in U.S. capital market. I think we can all leverage this talent to grow this amazing asset class. I like it. And if folks want to learn more, maybe want to kick the tires for themselves over there across tower. Where should they go? What should they do, Kapil? Uh, they should go to www.crosstower.com or uh, uh, they can always reach out directly to me, uh, my first name, couple at crosstower.com. 
and uh, I'm, I'm, I will be happy to talk to anyone on the street. He means it. He will be happy to chat with you. Well done, Mr. Rothy. Good to hear all these things going on. You guys have a lot of irons in the fire. We'll keep an eye on everything over there across town. I have to have you back on to see how things are unfolding in the coming months. Maybe, hopefully, the next time you're on, Koppel, all of this other 2020 madness that will all be in the rearview mirror, sir. All right. Great. Yep. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me. I look forward to keep coming on the show and, and just share amazing things I'm learning. All right, we'll keep an eye on everything across Tower as we keep on rolling into our next segment. It is time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trading activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Bitcoin Breakdown, the portion of the show where we do exactly that. We break down what's going on in the world's leading digital asset. Of course, we're talking about all things Bitcoin. Been another strong week. We've had a couple of strong weeks now in a row. Coming into showtime now, we're seeing a little bit of a fluctuation. I should say really about halfway through the show. We saw Bitcoin was a little bit higher coming into the show. It has given up some of that now. Still up pretty strong on the week as of a few minutes ago. Right, just crossed about 13 612, actually up to 13 620 now. So we're we're gapping around a little bit. Puts it up a little bit north of 700 handles, about 710 handles or so from where it was at the end of the show last week where we were still shy of the 13,000 level out there. All this movement means to get a little bit of vol back on the screen let's look backwards first let's go back over the previous 30 days see how the realized volatility is shaping up and that's ticked up a little bit up to about 38 percent from about 34 percent but looking forward is really where the action is in the options world that's of course the 30-day implied volatility and that's ticked up quite a bit it was about 49 percent on our last show it's closing in on a 60 percent now it's about 58 percent as of a few minutes ago so getting pretty volatile out there. 60%. There aren't many assets out there that have a sustained 60% volatility. Not really things that are major trading vehicles. You're going to see some small, maybe biotechs and pharmaceutical names pop into that. And some small products may hit there every now and then. But Bitcoin can sustain a 60 vol for quite some time, which is a pretty impressive level of volatility. Let's go out to the skew. The skew hasn't changed too much uh, since our last show. They've kind of been pretty consistent overall week on week. We've seen it tick down a little bit. The skew last week was about a negative 7%. Now we're looking at about a negative 8%. OI, though, a very strong resurgence out there. We've seen uh, Deribit is pretty much hovering at its about its recent max OI, right? About $2 billion. And if you add in all of the venues... Uh, we're a little bit north of two and a half billion. It ticked up to about looks like about two and three quarters billion. So not quite three billion, but getting pretty close out there. Of course, this resurgence in the price of Bitcoin seems to really have driven a lot of new OI out there. Let's break it down by venue. Of course, Deribit, the big dog, still with about seventy eight percent of the OI. And then we've got uh, CME coming in a little bit. So it's like some of their contracts coming off the board. They're at about ten percent right now. Still. Firmly number two, OKEX and Bit.com fighting neck and neck for the number three spot, both at about 5% of the OI and bring up the rear there. Ledger X with about 3%. Let's go to the options volume on Deribit first on the big dog. We had a big day back right before Halloween on the 30th, about a little north of half a billion, 553 million going up. That's the most contracts we've seen going up, most really notional value we've seen going up. In quite some time, the big day on our previous show was back on the 21st of October, about $459 million. We've also seen some spikes in the about a quarter of a billion range uh, recently as well, but nothing close to the over half a billion we saw going up on the 30th. So big day out there. <laughs> big day with some big and crazy prints going up out there as well. These may be, you know, we've been doing this show for... Coming up on two years now. doesn't seem like it's been that long, but it has. And these may be some of the craziest prints we've seen in Bitcoin options to date. These all went up on the 30th. If you think, you know, well, 10,000, maybe 12,000, 13,000, these are all sensible. Maybe 16,000 would be outlandish. Maybe 18, maybe even 20,000 would be pretty optimistic on the upside. What if I told you the big prints on that big day, October 30th, were on the Jan 36th? thousand calls 
Yes, I said that correctly. 36,000 calls. They went up in some massive blocks. An 8,000 lot for .003 Bitcoin. That's back when Bitcoin was at a little bit north of 13,000, about 13,285. By the way, if you're wondering, that's an 87 and a half implied volatility out there. So that's well north of the almost 60% we were just talking about. So they're paying up to get these. They did another 2,000 at .0047 Bitcoin, another 4,000 at .003. And this, this strike just kept trading. Another 1,800, another 2,200 out there. Just enormous, enormous volume total of about 16,000 contracts going up on this Jan 36,000 call strike. So <laughs> like I said, we're just north of the 13,000 level listeners. This trade looks like these were pretty much buys. That seems to be the case. I may have to dig a little more to confirm this, but it does seem like these are massive block buys going up. Just in case you're wondering, you need that underlying Bitcoin uh, to rally all the way to the 36,000 strike for these bad boys to pay off. Now, obviously, practically, you don't need it to go that far. If it spikes up anywhere close to that, there's Vega in these contracts. And so uh, you might see that price escalate just as a result of a sharp move, let's say, getting closer to the 20,000 strike. It doesn't need to get all the way to 36,000. Of course, by expiration day, it needs to be north of that. But if you get a nice aggressive gap in the near term to the upside, we could see some movement in these calls. But still, this is a very, very optimistic and probably one of the more interesting and or bizarre trades I've seen go up since I've been watching this space for a while now. This is a very near-term trade. You know, you might see some of these crazy upside call trades go up with, you know, December of 2022 or something like that. This is January of next year. So that is not too far from now. So someone is expecting Bitcoin to more than double in the span of a couple of months. I'm just trying to think of what the scenario would be that would precipitate that. That's probably not something that is good for the broad economy, for the broad marketplace, or the world as a whole. So uh, interesting stuff. What are your thoughts on these crazy prints going up here? 16,000 of the Jan 21, 36,000 calls going up. By comparison today, though, if you think there's more funky strikes afoot, you would be correct. Because coming into showtime, we saw about 800 of the Jan 40,000 calls going up today. So maybe some of the market makers trying to take off some of the other side of that, dumping the 40,000s. I don't know. Either way, weird strikes are afoot in January. And that also has completely obscured our strike positioning out here. What the number one strike is, it was the... 12,000 strike last week with 15,000 and 11,000 strike with 13,500. Both of those strikes are still active. 16,000 strike has 13,200 now, but both of those pale shadows next to the 36,000 strike with, as I said, now coming into today's show, I had a total about 19,300 open on that strike. So a few thousand more had gone up since that initial print on the 30th. So that's just absurd. That, that's a lot of OI in a very, very far out-of-the-money strike. Someone is expecting some big things to happen. Obviously, the election is coming up tomorrow, so that'll certainly be a big driver. I don't think that can get us to 36000 in Bitcoin, but still, that is, I think the technical definition of that is crazy town. But we'll see. We'll keep an eye on that. That's certainly a huge print, and it's distorting everything out there. I'm looking at the OI across the months. Adis is still the big dog, 41500 but not a lot went up in Dees. Uh, since our last show, only a couple of thousand contracts, net increase of OI, which is kind of interesting. Nov coming on strong, 36,900 out there. And, of course, Jan with about 22,900. So Jan coming on strong in the wake of those big upside call prints. Also, March starting to feel the love, about 28,200 out there. So some interesting action out there in all things Bitcoin. A lot of that October that went off the board seems like it almost immediately repositioned back in January. So... OI coming off the board and coming right back in for size and for the upside. And this time, not in a quarterly like Dees, like you might expect, or even March, but in a Jan contract. That's surprising, I think, to say the least. Look really quickly out here. Let's just take a quick stop at CME. By the way, you guys, if you're curious, 
you want to check the volume for yourselves and all the action going on, the SKU, the OI, everything over there. On the CME crypto products, we got a report for you completely free. CMEgroup.com slash TWIFO or slash TWIO. That's the name of our This Week in Futures Options program that we do every Thursday. If you go to that, that drop down, you can select cryptocurrencies and you could run these reports for yourself and see exactly what's been going up out there on the options front at CME. Not a heck of a lot on the tape coming into showtime here today. A total of about 41 contracts going up this week. So not a big day or week really out there on the options front. Futures, a little bit of a different story. 5,000 on the tape today, but about nearly 12,000 last Thursday. 15,000 last Wednesday and about 14,000 last Tuesday. So a lot of paper on the tape. Let's take a quick sojourn now beyond Bitcoin and head on out into the altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the The altcoin Altcoin universe. universe. All right, let's do it. Top 10 time listeners, you know the deal. Standard caveats apply here, etc., etc., and so on and so forth. Number 10, Bitcoin SV, about 2.9 billion. Number 9, Polkadot, almost 3.5 billion. Number 8, Litecoin. At about three and a half billion over there. Number seven, Binance Coin, a little bit north of four billion. Chainlink, number six, four point two billion. Number five, Bitcoin Cash, four point seven billion. Numero Quattro, there, our old friend XRP, ten point six billion. Tether, at about sixteen point six billion, firmly in the number three spot. Number two, that means it's ETH, forty three. Almost $44 billion. And number one with a bullet, once again, Bitcoin continuing its march north at about 200 pretty much a <laughs> quarter of a trillion dollars worth of market cap out there right now. Let's head on out to our number two. That's ETH. Not feeling the love that Bitcoin was feeling this week. Down a little bit, ever so slightly, about a point and a quarter from this time last show. Let's break down some of the vol out here. The 30-day realize going back 30 days. That's ticked up a little bit, up to about 50% from 45. Remember, that's a rolling frame of reference, 30 days there, listeners. So as things come in and out of that frame of reference, we're going to see that number move a little bit. 30-day implied, not so much on the movement front. Remember, that's looking forward 30 days. That's pretty much almost exactly the same as it was this time last week. It's about 59%. Last week, it was 58%. So not a heck of a lot going on out there. Even though we did see some volume, that same day we saw the big prints out there in Bitcoin land, we saw some action on ETH to the tune of about $42 million. That was October 30th. About $39 million on the tape coming into show today. So maybe today could surpass that. A little bit of action going on out there in ETH options today. Previous to this week, we saw some, some days of about $52 million. That was back on the 21st and $37 million on the 12th. So $42 million, right in line, a little bit higher than some of the days we've seen out there of late, but not exactly a explosive record day like we saw on the Bitcoin options on the same front. OI, same deal. It kind of came off a bit after expiration, but they're putting a lot of that back on. It's trending back up. Looks like it's closing in on about $450 million net across the top venues out there. So it had threatened half a billion not too long ago, and now it's at about $450 million. So OC coming off the board, but some of that's starting to be replaced uh, again. Let's go on out to good old Ripple. Not a heck of a lot of change out there since our last show. It was about 24.01. It's about 23 and a half on this show. So taking a break out there, the altcoins, a rare week where Bitcoin feeling the love and some of the altcoin feeling a little bit of the downside, which is kind of interesting. Usually that rising tide tends to lift all boats. Let's go on out to Bitcoin Cash. That's up a little bit, up about two, almost two and a half handles from last show. And good old Bitcoin SV down about 11, almost 11 and a half handles from this time last week. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for the crypto rundown for this week. I want to thank Koppel for joining us over there at Cross Tower. Check them out. If you are so inclined, just search for good old cross tower on the old browser machine. And if you want to go to the Twitter machine, just head on over to cross tower underscore EX of so cross tower exchange to get all the information on everything he was talking about, the stable coins, the regulation, everything else cooking. A lot of things going on over there in the realm of cross tower. Of course, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in your questions. We'll get to more of those next week and we'll see you back here throughout the week remember live election night special coming 
starting at about 6 p.m. Central tomorrow night. So if you can get our live feed, the Mixler feed will be live there. Maybe some other platforms as well, still figuring all that out. But we'll definitely be live starting at 6 p.m. Central and running until we have some clear idea what the heck's going on out there, at least for a few hours, probably about three hours at least. Maybe longer if I can maintain my voice for that long. We'll see. We'll have a great slew of guests joining me throughout the evening to break it all down. Remember, no crazy politics, no he said, she said, no, this guy is terrible, this woman is great. None of that. It's just going to be breaking down what's going on out there from a results perspective and how it's impacting the markets. Pretty straightforward. Should be some fun stuff. A lot of great guests joining me, so hopefully we'll see you there. And then we'll see you back here throughout the week for all the rest of the great content in the network before we hit you again next Monday with another episode of the Crypto Rundown. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.